Uh, hello everyone, so my name is Jean Frederic and I'm involved in Wikimedia Commons and the French chapter of Wikimedia France for many years. And I'm going to talk about hacking the public domain, which is you know, a very uh, inspiring motto, I think. That's, for all, that's why you're all here, I'm sure. Um, <coughs> so there is a couple of uh, uh, keywords here that I'm going to define very quickly. The first one is public domain. Who in this room doesn't know what is the public domain? Okay, everybody knows. Well, that's good, you know, because for, for example, the French law doesn't know what the public domain is. It's not even written anywhere, which sucks. Uh, <coughs> so here's a definition that was written by uh, the public domain manifesto. Uh, it's a, sorry, it's a public domain manifesto. It was a definition that was written as part of a European project, a research project. And I really encourage you to go to that URL. It's already a goldmine information of the public domain and what it should be. And so the public domain is, I had to pick up a definition, here's that one, it's the wealth of information that is free from the barriers to access or use, usually associated with copyright protection, blah, blah, blah. And it is a raw material from which new knowledge is derived and new cultural works are created. And this totally applies, as I see it, to the Wikimedia projects. I like to think of the Wikimedia projects as public domain havens. And for example, what we do is we gather uh, public domain works so for example, on Wikimedia Commons, we tag, one because it's millions as an S, well, yeah, okay, uh, we gather public domain and we tag it as such. And for a long time now, we've been, for quite a long time, we've been using the Creative Commons PD mark. So which, uh, that makes us something that we, because, well, we've got public domain for lots of reasons. It may be the United States government work, or it may be because it's old, or it may be because it's very old, or because it's very, 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 very old. And we've got, it's very hard to keep track of all the public domain we've got on Commons. We've got 13 million fines, and this is the only uh, number I can get to is 1,6 million fines using the, the PD mark. But I have no doubt that, in fact, we've got many more public domain works. Uh, on Commons, we also curate. So, for example, we had very useful categories such as the 18th century's old portraits of men at half length, which you will agree is <laughs> capital for uh, curating this uh, Commons of the mind. And finally, we build upon the public domain. It's not only a matter of gathering it and, hey, it's here, you can tap on it if you want. We also build upon it, remix it. And, for example, the French dictionary. Uh, was seeded using a public domain dictionary that was written at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And that is why the Wiktionary, which is the dictionary of the Wikimedia projects, really took off and by instantly having 30,000 more words. And this is how the, pro the project took off. So copy fraud. Who knows what copy fraud is? Oh, you're glad you came then. <laughs> the first lesson is that copy fraud is evil, so already... <laughs> And grave that in your mind, it's bad. <coughs> uh, copy fraud is a practice of claiming copyright on a public domain work, which is evil. And I'm going to say it a few times until you really remember it. <coughs> so for example, I was, um, when I was preparing a presentation, I was looking for an example. So that was a book I was reading in the plane from Paris to Washington. And this is Emma by Jane Austen that you may have read. It's, she's also the author of Pride and Prejudice, which is a bit more well known. And but in fact, this book is this book which was published in 1816 in Britain. And Jane Austen died, I don't remember when, but a uh, long time ago. <laughs> she was, basically, she's dead enough to be in the public domain. <laughs> and <coughs> <laughs> but that is what you can read here. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced without the prior permissions of publisher. What? Sorry? Come on. So. <laughs> But don't worry, this book is actually available on Wikisource, so en.wikisource.org slash wiki slash Emma, and you've got it all. So you're very glad that Wikisources have retired it. So this is the deed of the evil publishers, right? <coughs> if you actually read, the, um, it was a, a law paper which was written by a Harvard professor, a which called uh, Jason Mazzone, a few years ago, when she, which defined what copy fraud is. Yeah, he said, yeah, publishers are evil, they use that to get more money. But is that really uh, what it's all about? Because um, we can talk all day about how, publisher, how evil publishers are, but it's not the whole story. Uh, in fact, and we are in the glam session, and cultural institutions go down that evil road too. Uh, so, boo. <laughs> 
Uh, you get lots of reports uh, about how bad it is. Uh, I was really too lazy to read them all. So here's a study that I found. It was written in October 2009 by French, uh, a French uh, jurist, which is called Lionel Morel, which, is, uh, works, which used to work at the National Library. So the, he's a library curator. And he made an overview of website of archives in France. And so he found, he found 85 websites of archives. And he looked for the legal mentions. And they were all bevy of legal mentions. Uh, well, first of all, most of them didn't have any legal mention at all. So OK, what can I do with that? You don't know. And 80% of those had all rights reserved mentions. Ooh. Yeah, all for public domain works, of course. And 87% 87, 87 of uh, the legal mentions totally prevented you from any reuse online, commercial or non-commercial. You forget that even any reuse. I want to use it for any purpose. You can't, which is bad. So the old study is on the, uh, but it will be posted on Wikimedia Commons later. So you can just look your URLs later. So that was the situation two or three years ago. And then the glam wiki movement stormed the world. And so you've got plenty of presentations uh, with for all the awesome projects that have been going on for the last year in, uh, in the Wikimedia world. And here I'd like to have a more of a historic uh, perspective on that. There is, but what is there is too much uh, things that have been going on for really having a, a real history. So I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. Ah, yeah, crap. Uh, <laughs> so we've been doing lots of projects. And one uh, with which I, so let me be clear. All these projects are awesome, OK? So I'm not really trying to uh, belittle them. But there are a few things. So for example, in France, we, are a, we had a project with the BNF, which is the French National Library. So it's probably the equivalent of the Library of Congress in France. And we had years of negotiation with them, because the um, French National Library and its website, which is Gallica, you may know it, it's digital library. Uh, they actually say that everything is public domain, you, but they use uh, some weird uh, laws that we have in French to say that, okay, it's public domain, but still, you can't use it, and which is evil. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked with them for years, uh, negotiated at the French chapter, because that's what, what you do, and we finally got an agreement. And the agreement was uh, 1,400 books that, uh, you know, uh, the scans and the OCRs, so the, the optical character recognitions. Uh, they gave it to us, okay. uh, and I was quite involved in that because I was, uh, I'm a, as a day job, I'm a computer scientist uh, in bioinformatics, so I was one of the three guys who actually typed all the code that which was needed to get them wiki source and comments, which is, was totally an asshole, but anyway. Uh, so this is something I'm really proud of, but still, I thought, why did we do that? Why did we have this partnership? We had lots of reasons for having it for political reasons, because yeah, it's very important for some little chapter like Wikimedia France to actually sign a partnership with the freaking National Library of France, oh, which is awesome. It's a totally open door after that and everything. And But when it comes to the end, what did we say to the world? That we, you, we did say that to get the public domain books that are in the Digital Library of France, you have to sign a freaking partnership after two years of talks just to get the books. And that's not what the public domain is. You're supposed to be able to have them without any partnership or even without asking. <sighs> Apparently, I'm not the only one to think about this because you may have heard of uh, a little, uh, little some things that made a buzz in the Wikimedia and cultural institution world in July 2009 about the National Portrait Gallery of London. I just learned that there is one in Washington too, which is very <laughs> nice actually, I said so. <laughs> this is the one in London. Um, there was a Wikimedian who actually, because uh, they have high uh, resolution um, uh, digi digitizations of their portraits, and there was a Wikimedian who actually uh, circumvented their, um, is everyone familiar with this case, or just to know, no you're not? Uh, well, obviously Wikimedians knew. Uh, he basically, he downloaded, downloaded them all, and by doing so, he probably broke one or two of the terms of conditions, and maybe one law, it's not sure. So the National Portrait, and he put them on Wikimedia Commons, with this is public domain, and we got this from the National Portrait Gallery of London website, thanks to them. And the National Portrait Gallery apparently wasn't very happy with that, because they sent a, uh, a letter threatening uh, this man, which, was a, which is an American citizen, 
saying, uh, okay, you remove the pictures or we sue you. Uh, the guy got in um, a lawyer from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And at the time, that was what the Wikimedia Foundation said. Uh, it's a post in a blog post, which was written by Eric Muller, which we can find it at the URL at the bottom in July 2009, saying lots of things, saying that we were working with cultural institutions, that we think they are awesome and everything, but that we sympathize with their desire for revenue stream. And yet, is that revenue stream requires an institution to lock up and limit access to its educational material, uh, that won't do it. So that was the idea at the time. We want to collaborate, we want to do th stuff with us, but don't screw with it. Public domain is sacred. Another story that came in was in February 2011, that's closer to us. It was Google Ad Projects. Is everyone familiar with that? So basically, uh, Google used uh, its technology uh, to digitize uh, in very uh, in gigapixel resolution uh, works of art in uh, many museums in Europe and in the United States. And yes, that's it. Um, so probably 1,000 files uh, about it. And they used it was they made a, they put together a website which you, you you could walk into the museum using their Street View technology and you could zoom on the um, on the paintings and zooming, 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 z just to see the strokes of painting. And well, a Wikimedia Commons user, uh, actually the same that from the National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> uh, well, actually, it, ripped, it took them all. It just, it, it so basically use a script to zoom in. This is not meant to be a technical presentation, but uh, well, I'd like, to, if you want for more details on the actual process, I suggest we keep that for the questions because uh, I'm running probably out of time just right now. Uh, so he zoomed in, made a script just to stitch the images back together and uploaded them on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, so he wasn't sued this time around, but this is what we could, we could read on the Wikimedia Commons Village Pump, which is the place that we discuss things. Uh, this is um, a real uh, glam wiki, a very well-known glam wiki advoca uh, advocative that I don't put his name because I'm not sure if he's comfortable with, but uh, is around somewhere in Wikimedia. He said, this is ignoring the longer term and ethical issues of whether we should be taking these images. Didn't we learn anything from the NPG fiasco, NPG in London? Because um, apparently uh, this guy spends most of his, sp at some point he spent most of his time apologizing on behalf of this user because apparently some crypto ins institutions were not very happy with the fact that Wikimedians <coughs> just come around crack the door and uh, take the stuff for some reason, which are sometimes understandable. Uh, and this is what, what some another Wikimedian answered to him. Yes, we learned to stand up to odious and reprehensibly fraudulent claims of copyright and public domain works, because those are actually morally and ethically wrong and need to be stood up to every time. And this was really a time when, uh, the, uh, in, in my view, which is just my view, where the Wikimedia uh, community was split up between uh, the folks that were saying uh, culture and institutions are a god mine not only of just stuff that we want, but only of knowledge, of processes, of best practice, and we want to work with them. And the other one says, and the other part uh, was saying, okay, sure, but as long, if they put some fraudulent claims on public domain works, well, that's their problem and we won't mind it and we'll take the stuff because there is no world in which this is acceptable. And this community was split up that. And I won't give my opinion on that because it's, uh, well, <laughs> kind of uh, evilness. Um, anyway, uh, another case uh, quite recently, uh, well, a year ago already, is a JSTOR. Does everyone know about the JSTOR website? It's a website that uh, holds uh, uh, scientific papers and for scientific publication then. And this is usually, uh, you can't access JSTOR. Uh, for example, I can from my university network, and so if you are academics, you'll probably have access to. But if you are some kind of regular guy, you have to pay $20 from, for just reading an article, and there are crappy conditions like in one computer for one month and only that. Uh, so some people call it uh, racket. Uh, is that, yeah, that is, well. Uh, you make up your own mind. It touches on another subject, which is open science and uh, open access, uh, which I, I won't um, I won't delve into because it's way too much. 
And there is no quote for that because the only quote I read was, oh, Gao, sir, you are a hero. So uh, there was actually two uh, different issues. Uh, there was an uh, activist, which is called Aaron Schwartz, who downloaded five million articles from JSTOR, and JSTOR wasn't uh, really happy with that, so they sued him. And he actually... No, they didn't. They didn't? No. They threatened to do it. And no. They didn't. No, they didn't. It was, the, it was the feds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't like. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. This was uh, JSTOR is not an, one of these evil publishers. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but thank you for the. Uh, yes, he, the the federal government uh, prosecuted him. You charged him. I'm not sure where the story is now, but anyway. Yeah, it would take years anyway. And and a few weeks later, another uh, Wikimedia Commons user actually. Uh, put on Torrent Bay uh, uh, a torrent with uh, 18,000 uh, articles, which are in the public domain, which is not also the case of the 5 million articles that I want trust took. And, well, uh, nobody said anything about it, uh, with frankly. Uh, some activists said, yeah, way to go. And <laughs> actually, and a few weeks later, JSTOR uh, opened, part, I'm not, I don't have the details, the prob some of you probably have better details than I. Uh, they opened part of the collections. Uh, and they said that it wasn't related, that they thought about it for a long time, but it just pushed their agenda forward, if uh, that's correct. And I'm running out of time. Um, so this is what we call hacking the public domain, circumventing the technologi technological measures that some institutions put in place to, uh, according to what the people that do that say, uh, get back what is ours. And this is an, uh, a motto which is, uh, which is coined, in, in, at least in French, in September 2011 by the same jurist that I uh, quoted earlier, Yann Morel. And you can find his all article at the URL at the bottom. Um, I could delve into what he said, but I'd like to uh, have uh, another story uh, that I'd like to, the story of this map. Uh, this map is uh, something very weird, I, I should like put it. It's a, a map comparing the main aids of France by department. So for example, uh, oh you can't read anything actually, uh, but it's in the full resolution in Wikimedia Commons. So. Uh, but you say in this region of France, the biggest, uh, the highest point is this, and well, very useful. And there was a user, a Wikipedia, a French Wikipedia, which is very famous in France, uh, that wanted this because it actually wrote an article about uh, aids of different departments in France. And it was in the uh, Gallica website, in the French National Library. And well, if I may quote him and say, well, these Gallica guys are very nice, but they refuse to give their scanned documents in any other format that postage stamp. Of course, there is a complicated setup to zoom on the documents based on flash and crappy ergonomics, but it seems that Mr. Gallica has not really understood what the public domain is about. So instead of downloading the document and doing whatever I want with it, I am stuck with a crappy interface, barely usable, wow. <laughs> and if I want the full size of this document in the public domain, did I mention that? The library, an educational public service, did I mention that? Insults me by giving me a form to fill so that for a fee, I may have it someday. We'll see. So uh, this guy basically thought uh, challenge accepted and uh, <coughs> he used some uh, technological uh, things that I won't delve into either. <laughs> and uh, to get it, well, he spent a night drinking, uh, drinking tea and uh, taking the, the map back and putting on comments. And this is what he say. The first moral of the story is that public services are not, even when they pretend to be so. Gallicans that day, I saw in you an enemy who barred me the access to something which is nothing else than my own. <laughs> and this guy is named Pulpi, which is an octopus in French, so hence the uh, illustration. Gallica, I like you and all, you have a lot of documents, very useful, but you do not answer the most basic requirement of public service, being at the service of the public. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> uh, the old blog post is golden, just like this, it's in French, but uh, I'll translate it someday. And I thought to myself, and I read that and say, wow, how did we end up with that? I mean, a citizen saying to one of, this, of the main library, is that saying that he's there in the m an enemy? How did we come to that? We're supposed to work together. How, uh, what, did we that what did happen to the old motto of we're doing the same thing for the same reason, let's do it together and uh, shake hands and everything. And this guy, which is 
passionate about sharing knowledge. He's created he's probably the guy who created the most articles on French Wikipedia ever. Um, why do you see these people as enemy? Well, I ask you. Um, so this is kind of crappy situation, I think. But uh, I'm r kind of hopeful for the future for two reasons. Uh, well, for one reason is because times have changed since uh, the studies that Lionel Morel published uh, with archives. Uh, saying this is our stuff, don't touch it, uh, or we'll see you. Uh, times have changed in several, uh, in several parts, and I think the key point of that is awareness. And the awareness of institutions, that uh, of what we think is the public domain, of other ideas of what they can accomplish their mission, and, oh wow, I've got plenty of time, to, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been rushing it. Um, <coughs> sorry, uh, in, yes, institutions do know what we believe it's a public domain, and uh, even if it's got a problem with uh, money income and everything, uh, they, uh, we teach them that, for example, it may cost them more money to actually monetize uh, their collections. In France, we are talking with museums who say, yeah, uh, we've got a, full, uh, a person which is dedicated to actually answer uh, uh, public domain material uh, when people, when you know, citizens ask for material, and you got a person answering, hey, yes, okay, you can have it for uh, 10 euros or something. It's actually, uh, so th they've got some money coming to that, but yeah, just paying the guy to do that takes more time and more money. So uh, actually teaching them that there might be another way is, uh, is something. And also awareness in the public. I, I think that uh, this, big, uh, this big coup, these events such as the National Portrait Gallery, which actually made the headlines. Um, they were kind of, um, how do you say that in English, but a realization, uh, it was an eye opener thing, I uh, for institutions. Uh, yes, there are people outside who actually want their stuff, which is actually a good and a bad thing. And it was actually uh, eye opening for the public uh, to regain, that they have the right to regain what they, what they want and they, have the, they can hack their way have it and this is uh, this is twofold this is act in the sense of ignoring whatever spurious copyright claims they might put on it they might slap on their material and this is uh, converting the technical technological measures uh, I'd like to think that of t panes of digital glass that they put around the material just like in a museum where you, you're allowed to touch to see but not to touch I think people now know that um, they have the right to take it well, or they can believe that they have the right to take it, so to be politically correct, and that uh, they have the tools to do it. And a few weeks ago, uh, on the French uh, Wikipedia village, some guy said, hey, I made uh, this tool so that uh, with it, anyone can download a big, uh, a big picture from Gallica without writing a single line of code. And you know, some totally for the non-tech savvy people. And people like, hey, that's cool. And nobody said, but, oh, you don't wonder what the library would say to us. And nobody said either, okay, cool, we're gonna just rip them off and take all the stuff and take it to Wikimedia Commons. Now people just say, okay, cool, if I need a document, I just ask you and you'll do it for me. Because uh, it's not, uh, I think the uh, people don't think in terms of ripping people off anymore, ripping institutions off anymore. They just want to collaborate and if they need a document, they just take it because they have the right to do it and they can't do it. And because, because the library doesn't want to give it to them. Of course, of course, this whole point is moot if the library just say, hey, just ha you can just have it. And actually, which is this is why I'm also hopeful for the future because um, there are initiatives such as like the Europeana where uh, if you want to be part of Europeana, they explain to you, well, you have to put your metadata under CC0 and you have to really uh, state that this is public domain. And actually, some insti many institutions seem to be cool with that, which I found awesome. But I like to stress out that if they're not okay with that, the citizen would just ignore it because they feel empowered to do so now. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, Well, f regarding the National Gallery, as I remember, there was problem with uh, the UK copyright law. Yes. Like in, 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 in most countries, uh, the copyright uh, 
uh, is only about the uh, f, uh, new f, f, f intellectual efforts. Like in case of the British one, any intellectual effort is even if it's just copying, collecting things. This is also under copyright. So this was the problem, as I remember. And yeah. and from another point of view, if, uh, when we are talking with people from archives and uh, another such uh, such places, so I sometimes a little bit understand the point of view. For example, we started cooperation with the. Polish uh, governmental archi uh, archive of old uh, documents. And they show us how does it look like. So this is, you know, building as large as this one with kilometers of files, right? Mm -hmm. And then the real effort for this is not only keeping this, but let's say to select those which are really interesting, then put it them in the white gloves very carefully to, to, to make a really nice scan only once because it's very fragile paper. And then they required to, to have something from this. I mean, of course, all these documents are in public domain, but they did quite a lot of effort to provide this to the people. And then they want to do something uh, even not from legal point of view, but simply from moral point of view. So. Sure. So this is why they sometimes put this under this electronic uh, glass and say don't touch it, this is a kind of something very special and they want to give this impression. And then you, me, or another guy from Commons comes and take it, just break, break this, this glass and, and take it, right? So this is the feeling. <laughs> Whereas it's not much to enter that, but I'd just like to say that I don't really understand why people are using something like copyright, like, well, like copyright, to enforce something which is just a moral stand up, just a moral standpoint. Yes, you cite people and you cite the institution for keeping it. It's just common sense, and I'm just all against enforcing and using copyright. I work in the uh, uh, in the research, and there articles. It doesn't matter if you are if they are under Creative Commons or if they are full copyright. But when you use the work of someone else, you just cite him, and that's a moral point. Of, that's a moral standpoint. And I'm not sure it's a good idea to just mix copyright with that. And as for the UK law, uh, yes, it's true that there is a, a doctrine which is the sweat of the borough. And it is said that uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, you don't have to make something really original for your mind to gain copyright protection, but it just put a lot of skill and effort into that. Uh, you gain copyright protection. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, well, I'm a copyright nerd, just like every Wikimedian, probably. <laughs> but um, it was seriously undermined, as I understand it, a few months ago by your case law. So uh, I'm not familiar with that, so I can't really explain it. But basically, Wikimedian Commons user uh, more believe even even more now that this is probably bullshit to use sweat of the bro to to uh, that. And it's it's not. Like I said, in France, they don't use copyright to pr to lock public domain. They use something else, but it doesn't matter. To me, it's just it's still copy fraud. I, even if they use trademarks, patents, database law, whatever, uh, this doesn't change anything. Uh, next question. Yeah. So my question it has to do with the French person that you mentioned had the, all of this going on with the, in in France with the library. Did he ever f ask or find out why? He had to fill out the form. Why he had to pay? I, I, ask, I don't think so. I ask because I think that it gets to the root of really what's going on. I mean, I, I don't know if the, if a librarian or a museum, uh, you know, keeper would want to really block public domain. I think that maybe this is coming more from higher up. So we're talking about return on investment. We're talking about business ideas. Where is the budget coming from? What does the government want to see for profit? These people are spending, you know, the government's spending money to help, you know, to employ all of these people. And then for them to put all this effort in getting these works available to the public should be a public service, has been said, and free to the public. But the government isn't thinking like that. The government is thinking from a return on investment Income. point of view. Sure. And so it's not the museums, the libraries, the archives, or the galleries who are, quote unquote, the enemy. Yeah, it's the government. Maybe you could say in the legislation, and that process needs to change. Yeah, so, um, yeah. that's true. Uh, but you just don't attack the government like it is. Uh, no, what the truth is, well, actually, in France, uh, for the French National Library, uh, I'm not sure you can ask why this is because this is a 
such a huge institution it's a bureaucracy probably at some point and yes it's probably coming from higher and uh, it's probably not the secretary just actually processes the demands that uh, is against that obviously um, some it's not about for just sorry for talking always about France, but this is what I know about, basically, if I just finish that. Uh, in France, there is uh, actually uh, the official state voice is that uh, cultural institutions must share, uh, must share the stuff. That's the official voice. And below that, there is a, a trans, um, uh, a, a, an institution, an entity more, because I'm never sure if that's a company or cultural, cultural institution, uh, which doesn't belong to the museum, but actually manage the, all of them. And this is, yeah, there's a French guy in the room who knows what I, who I'm talking about. Uh, this is, it's called the RMN. And this is the people that have contracted in basically every museum around. And even if the museums want to share the stuff, and if even if they say, hey, we've got the state for us, because you know there is this uh, big report that they published two years ago about sharing a common cultural uh, heritage. Uh, yeah, uh, this entity actually says, I have exclusive contract with them, and uh, they log them around, they, they log them apart. And, but the true story of, and I just finished with that, is that this entity um, manages the, the, the sale of reproductions, of digitizations, and they also say all the goodies and stuff. And all the goodies and stuff, it's something like n more than 90% of their income. And just locking things around, just, they just get n nothing with that. And this is uh, Jarek Kuzinski? Yeah, Jarek Tuszynski. Jarek Kuzinski, okay. So let's give our first presenter a round of applause. So I actually am not sure exactly why I am in a legal thing. It's a it's much more technical presentation than anything else. Uh, so I'm sorry that uh, some people might end up in the wrong uh, uh, in things that they are not that interested about. Uh, but uh, uh, I do a lot of work uh, on commons. I do a lot of work with uh, templates. Uh, did some work with mass uploads of images. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, interna internationalization, or people call it localization, of uh, some of the messages. So uh, since there is a lot of, there might be more of the uploads, I would wanted to share some of the experiences of uh, kind of uh, how to do it so other people can benefit the most out of that. So that's the basic uh, abstract. Actually, I'm not going to go through that. But uh, uh, there is m all the files on commons, they have an info box. And uh, there's multiple, I'm sure everybody is familiar with those that ever look at commons files. And they have uh, many different roles. First, uh, they, they are describing what the file is. And if we are dealing with uh, metadata coming from large institutions, we want to make sure that uh, we don't lose stuff, that, uh, that, that uh, we don't lose metadata if copying from other websites. Uh, uh, also, a big part of the information uh, that is being stored on the, uh, with each image is some. There should be enough information that one can verify the license. <laughs> so if license says that uh, you know, the author dies um, more than 70 years ago, there should be something to allow you to verify if that's uh, correct or not. Uh, also, those uh, templates allow you the internationalization. And uh, it's very important for commons, especially since uh, uh, it is one database of all the images that are shared among whatever, 280 Wikipedias. Uh, and uh, although the most people that operate in Commons seem to know English, the assumption is that uh, not everybody does. And uh, the information store there should be accessible for people that uh, might not necessarily be very good in English. Uh, and so, uh, ideally, the metadata about the image, I don't know, you're looking at Mona Lisa or something, all the metadata should be really in the language of the, presented in the language of the user, uh, which often you can either say, if you are a logged in user, you can say uh, what your preference is, or if you came from, by link from some Wikipedia, 
then it's usually in the language of that Wikipedia. Uh, also, if there are any links, uh, let's say you have a link to a city, it would be nice if that they actually link to the, uh, to the Wikipedia article in a language that you understand. Uh, also, another th role of uh, infoboxes uh, on commons is that uh, um, if there is a lot of metadata, you sh there should be as little duplication as possible. You know, it's a, it's a bad idea to have a, a, the same data, metadata repeated many, many times because if one things have to change, then you have to suddenly uh, using bots to change, you know, 50 different places. And finally, the machine readability. So, uh, although it's supposed to be good for readable to humans, uh, sometimes uh, that HTML is being scanned by all kinds of uh, people interested in the things and uh, we should help them as much as possible being able to uh, uh, mark what piece of data is what so they can make a better sense of that. So with that in mind, uh, the, there are kind of uh, three tiers of uh, infobox templates that you, you might find on commons. The most general is uh, information template, which is used by about 11.6 uh, million files, which is 88%, and that's good enough for most of the files. <laughs> it has uh, uh, fields for you know, author, description, date, source, permission, other versions, and that's about it. And uh, if uh, I'm uploading pictures I took of, I don't know, buildings here or things like that, uh, that would be perfectly fine uh, template to use. Um, it is often accompanied by the location template, which allows you to add uh, geolocation information. Uh, there is about um, 2.8 millions of those. So uh, th those two templates often go together. Uh, then there is a next level of specialization. So there are templates for uh, specifically for artwork, for 2D and 3D artwork, usually uh, yeah, from museums with a kind of a metadata that one would see in a museum. Uh, it's about uh, 360,000 of those. There is a recently the created um, a very similar template called Photograph, which is uh, almost the same as artwork, but it's uh, more suitable for uh, large collections of photographs as opposed to paintings of sculptures. Uh, there's also a, a book uh, a template, which is suitable for uh, if one, uh, some people are uh, the, the French uh, uh, library scanning uh, hundreds of thousands of books with picture for each individual page. That's the template which is usually used for uh, uh, marking all those uh, images. There's also other specialized templates. Uh, I don't know, there's uh, I think templates for airplanes, buses, stamps, probably a bunch of other things that people develop. Um, and the third level of uh, specialization is uh, customized templates that are for mass uploads uh, of images from single source. Those are often created by uh, if some partnership institution uh, uh, donates large volume of images, then uh, often those uh, uh, customized templates are created uh, for them uh, to, uh, they often have uh, some ch little differences in metadata that uh, if you want to capture all the metadata, it's better to uh, s specialize them. So there is one for Bunders Archive upload, um, Datish Phototech upload, Walters Art Museum, National, uh, National Archives, and several other institutions. And uh, uh, those should be used mostly if uh, one of the other four standards templates is uh, not suitable. So let's look at the examples of uh, actually code and what it looks like. So here are we, uh, we are looking at the uh, artwork template. That's what the code looks like. And this is what is creating, uh, what the, the output is in English. Uh, this output is in Polish. So, uh, you know, you can see that the field names are translated. Uh, but also, uh, since uh, 
special templates are used for, let's say, in the medium part, uh, the term oil on canvas is translated into uh, Polish language. Uh, the same thing with the uh, dimensions. Uh, so, you know, di uh, since a uh, special template is used, the dimensions are translated from English to Polish. Uh, similarly, one could use uh, templates for dates. Uh, there are templates for descriptions and uh, several of those I'm going to be talking about. There are also uh, uh, something that we call the uh, creator templates that I'm going to talk a little, uh, a little bit in a moment, and institution templates. Those are, uh, here they show up as a one line, but uh, they are expandable templates, so if you click on them, they just kind of uh, open up and you can uh, read much more information uh, either about the institution or about the author. Um, so, uh, internalization, that's a, if, People didn't see this thing. That's a, a short name for internationalization, which seemed to be a little bit too long to uh, be writing down each time. Um, it took me a while to figure out, first time I have seen that, what it is, uh, of artwork template. So those are the fields that uh, uh, are often need that. And in author field, uh, usually uh, one of the creator templates is, uh, I'll have more about the institution, one of the institution templates is usually used. Um, if dates are in the format of, a, that's a, one of the ISO standards, I don't remember which number, but if they are in a year, month, day standard, then the, all the templates can right now take the, the uh, dates in that format and uh, present them in a language of the user. However, if, um, if the dates are a little bit more wishy-washy, you know, it's about that century, it's 1930s, it's before something happened or between some years, then there is a special paper, uh, template called uh, Other Date, which is used for, to uh, translate that into multiple languages. Uh, the same thing for medium. Uh, or sometimes medium, uh, medium techniques seem like people cannot decide of which is a better term. Uh, so there is a technique template, which can be used uh, to internalize uh, phases like some kind of adjective noun and something else on something else. Uh, that's kind of a basic form. So it might be, uh, I don't know, oil on uh, oak board. <laughs> or it could be, uh, I don't know, something else and something else. On. So that's often the form that it takes. Uh, right now, the, we are supporting vocabulary about 500 nouns uh, and 60 adjectives that are being translated into 30 languages. Now, uh, uh, that does not mean that we have uh, 500 nouns in 30 languages. It just means that uh, we have some of them are translated into 30 languages and uh, 500, uh, I don't know if any language have uh, all 500 uh, filled. Uh, for a while, I was trying to uh, uh, be translating some of those into Polish language. Um, however, I mean, it, uh, uh, I'm originally from Poland. I left Poland about 20 years ago, and uh, yeah, I could do the, maybe the first hundred, but eventually they were going into, I mean, I have never heard about some of those things in English or in Polish. So uh, <laughs> could use some specialized help with some of those terms. Uh, uh, the same with uh, dimensions, uh, you know, there's uh, some uh, size template. Uh, is this uh, one of the simplest from those? But uh, what it can do is that um, it can translate terms like you know, width, height, depth, diameter, terms like this, but can also display numbers uh, in uh, either metrics and or SI system, depending on the language. So if you, uh, you come from English Wikipedia, you will see it probably those dimensions both in metric and in, uh, I mean, uh, actually, English and metric, I mistake here. So in, you might see it in inches and centimeters. Uh, but if you come to, there from, I don't know, German Wikipedia, you're only going to see it in centimeters. Uh, finally, there is a the field that uh, not often filled with some of those things, but the object history which is usually main of a, of a, as a, a ownership history. 
Uh, so the, there is a template that is used for uh, uh, translating all those. And they usually have things like, you know, at this date, this work was acquired by this guy from the guy of some other name. That's kind of a format that one see. Uh, creator and institution templates. Um, the idea there is that, um, uh, I don't know, we might have uh, several hundred images by Leonardo da Vinci, let's say. And it would be pretty silly to be saying dates of birth or some additional information after the name for each time he's being mentioned. So eventually someone have a good idea and created a template, you know, called, you know, creator template uh, for the guy. So from now on, you can just include the, the particular template and all the information related to him uh, would be captured and can be displayed, which helps because uh, uh, if you don't have it, then you often end up with the, that, I don't know, uh, half of the files have those dirts, days of birth and death and some other half have a totally different. So you can never figure out which one is the <laughs> semi-impossible to uh, keep them all in sync. So for metadata about creators, and that will be painters, sculptors, writers, uh, it's stored in the creator templates. Right now we have uh, 12 and a half thousands of those. Uh, metadata about glam institutions, again, galleries, libraries, archive museums, uh, we store in uh, insti institution templates. And uh, we have much fewer, about one and a half thousand of those. Um, both sets of the templates uh, occupy their own specialized namespace, which is, uh, might be interesting to, uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, as I showed, uh, they, they in the file namespace, uh, those templates are collapsed, but you can click on them and then they're gonna expand and show much more information. Uh, also, uh, both of those uh, templates allow you to introduce the uh, authority control information. So you can add uh, links to, I don't know, uh, VF or uh, a Library of Congress or you know, uh, whatever institution. Uh, so here are some examples of a creator template. So here will be the code. You have a name uh, that, uh, depending on the language, you might go to an article in the different languages. And um, the information about, uh, you know, occupation, painter, photographer, the dates in a specific format. And it is being translated. Uh, so you can see that the dates are being translated from this format to uh, whatever. Uh, the information about uh, uh, nationality, gender, and the uh, occupation is translated to actually a, a, a full sentence. And the same page uh, shown in Russian will show, you know, all the information would look differently, except for this one, which was not being translated because uh, I guess it's just direct link to uh, Polish Wikipedia for that one. Uh, and this, is, this part is the authority control. So we have a link about this uh, person in the Library of Congress or in a German uh, database or whatever else might be. Also, mm, this one, if you click, you will go to Wikipedia. If you click this one, you're gonna go to Wikisource uh, for an article about the same person. This is example of the institution template. Uh, so again, um, uh, it's a very similar one. You know, you have a location where it is, coordinates, uh, website. Uh, if you want more information, you can go directly to the source. Again, authority control. Uh, so those two are very similar to each other. Um, so it, um, that is uh, ideally, if you if one does batch upload, large batch upload, it is good to get all those kind of. Uh, templates resolve before you upload them, <laughs> uh, since it's a pretty hard thing to do after it's uh, uploaded. So um, a big challenge is often if you have a large database of authors to matching them to actually uh, people in the uh, commons creator templates and uh, commons categories. The same thing with institutions. You might know that the, you know, the metadata says that, hey, it's in some museum in Italy, 
but to find the pay category of the same museum in Italy in Commons, maybe a slightly different name, might be quite challenging. So that's one of the kind of big um, challenge of batch uploads. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through that one. So just examples of some more of a, uh, here's examples of some customized templates. Uh, so this is a template that, uh, from Walters Art Museum. And you can see that uh, they, on their website, they have a much more information that we managed to capture it with our templates as well. So here is a, a page from some uh, uh, Islamic manuscript. And you know, we both have authors, scribe, and artists for that particular document. Uh, also, example of ownership history. They have a pretty good uh, records of those, and we managed to capture them. The same uh, images from, and that's my last slide, from the uh, National Archives. Uh, again, it's a, you know, managed to uh, add extra fields that were not in the regular templates. Um, but, uh, so, any questions? Uh, the aim of this talk is mostly to introduce uh, people a brief introduction in 25 minutes to a pretty complicated world of uh, templates and commons. Do we have questions from the audience, please? Yes. So I'm from um, an institution called OCLC who run VF. And um, one of the interesting things about that is um, given a VF number, you can query the site for the uh, official name from the official uh, library uh, uh, authority files. Have you ever made an, has there ever been any inroads to using um, an, a VF number to automatically get uh, the official names in different languages based on just entering in a single parameter? Uh, so actually, uh, right, uh, someone introduced the uh, uh, transfer from Wikisource uh, gadget that um, uh, if you are on one of the cre either in a creator or institution page, you click this little button and uh, it searches a VF uh, database and finds the entry with the same name and allows you to, with uh, another click, just add those authority control. And within one month, some of the users on Commons just got really crazy with that. And they start adding it to thousands of, uh, I mean, it's a manual process, <laughs> you know, but uh, I think uh, between two or three guys, they did like over a thousand. Uh, so uh, it is being, but it's, it's not, um, I'm sure that one can probably do it on a scale of uh, tens of thousands, since, you know, uh, by a bot of some sort. I mean, all you have to do is match a name and maybe dates of birth and death. And, you know, if you, if you there is a, I think there are categories for about 120,000 people on commons, and it wouldn't be too hard to just grab all those names, uh, dates of birth and death, and compare it to a, a database, and uh, if you get matches in 30%, you know, <laughs> you have a 60,000 uh, uh, authority control things, that uh, templates that can be added. So. so with those templates, have you thought of, or are you doing uh, matching between the fields that are in there and uh, other like embedded microdata or RDFA in the actual HTML? So like using schema.org or other RDFA type standards that are then make that information crawlable by search engines so that it's um, you so know, there were, not just human readable. There were some attempts to do that. Uh, I'm not very good at that. Okay. So I was, uh, and, and other people that work on those templates were, we tried to maintain what other people have done, but we don't know, you know, uh, we're trying not to break what other people have done. Right. But there is nobody actively actually looking and maintaining Maintaining or doing actual work on that, which I think would be very valuable. I mean, it was one of my points that uh, uh, ideally it would be searchable by some kind of a bots. And uh, you know, if, if someone uh, have any knowledge of that, that would be I'll happy talk to, to you to, uh, later. Uh, yeah. next, next question, folks. And any other questions? Okay. Well, then we'll we'll give this gentleman a round of applause. And, and we have at least one other uh, speaker scheduled. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, yes, Samuel Klein is our next speaker. Let's see if this adapter works. It didn't work. Uh oh. 
Oh, well, there's this. I've got one here if that works. No. All right, let's see. Hello, everyone. The joys of using a Mac laptop here. Yeah, that's right. I'm actually a little embarrassed to have joined the forces of Macintosh. <laughs> my, uh, I've been, my ThinkPad was stolen recently, and this was the nearest laptop to hand, but I'm getting used to it. Uh, it's great to see so many people who are bi-curious about both law and glams. I think that is awesome. I don't know if all of you saw the fire hazard in the back of the room at the start. Uh, I'm, I'm primarily, I, pr I primarily want to give this talk to get feedback from all of you about how we can build a better collaborative digital library. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a project, which is the Digital Public Library of America. And despite the name, the, the design is to make sure that there are cultural and scientific works accessible to everyone in the world. Let me see if I can get projection to work, though. So how many people here work for a public institution? And how many of you have had to either share data with another institution or have asked another institution for data in the last three months? Let's see. All right, wait, keep those hands up. And how many of you who are from private institutions have had to do the same thing? All right, awesome. And I assume most people here have a commitment to sharing knowledge. I mean, one of our, one of our problems, as Jean-Fred was, was, was explaining, is that we had this cultural dilemma about how to convert that into actual institutions. Hmm. Give me just a minute. Um, so while I'm setting up my display preferences, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. How many people here have heard about the Digital Public Library of America at all? Great. We are in DC, so that's nice. <laughs> so it started with a consortium of, of existing libraries and, and a few museums, a few other digital archives, who wanted to find a better way to share, share data. And they were looking at what Europeana had done in Europe. And they looked at how a lot of the discussion around the Google Books settlement, or the Google Books discussion was, well, hey, wouldn't it be great if libraries did this? But ha ha, libraries don't know how to do this. So uh, don't worry, it will all be done anyway. And on the one hand, some people were skeptical that it would, that it would be done. On the other hand, the libraries felt bad. They said, this is our job. Even if we're not the only person providing this kind of service, these sorts of, this sort of large scale access to data uh, should, be, should be easy and free for everyone in the country and, and really for everyone to, to partake in. So starting about, um, starting about two years ago, these discussions began. And then about oh. nine months ago, uh, a number of foundations came together and said, we will fund an initial prototype of, of a thing, something which will, which will provide digital library services, support all the current, uh, all the current digital glams in the country, provide, figure out what a, a better platform would be and a better, um, a better set of services would be to help those institutions grow and not duplicate too much effort. And, um, and in 18 months, please come back with an initial prototype, whatever that is back with a, a design and an implementation that you think is, is a good first step. All right, so, so we're currently about halfway through the, that 18 month period. And um, so far, there have been a few hundred community members in different, in different work streams working on various parts of the project, from legal to technical to governance to finance to uh, audience and participation. Who should we be considering who are not traditional glams but might run a very large digital archive like Media. And um, with half that work done, there's now a bit of a platform. There are some initial services with APIs, and there's a discussion about how those APIs can be, can be better used by different groups, what kinds of data people are really interested in sharing, what's easy and hard in the current landscape without any sort of central platform with a lot of, with a lot of individual shared services. So I'll show you a, a few examples of what people are discussing today and what, and what open questions there are. And, uh, or I'll tell you, I mean, I'll show you. And, and, and we're going to have a, um, a few a breakout sessions on Sunday in the end conference for people who are in different sectors who are trying to, who are trying to share data. There is uh, there's a lot of institutional support for this kind of work. There are people, especially at the archive and, and um, let's say, governance level, who want to make this happen. There's funding from some technology groups like Mozilla Ignite who are trying to support all kinds of large-scale data, but they're very interested in this kind of 
traditional uh, exposure of traditional scientific and, and cultural knowledge data. And uh, and there are some there are some juicy open questions. So I are there, is anyone here working on wiki data or working on structured data? One, two, awesome. So uh, there, there's certainly a, a cluster of, uh, of excellent work which is related to how to capture different kinds of data when data is changing, when you want to have different variations. Hey! <laughs> Great, all right. So um, building a collaborative public digital library is not necessarily easy. Europeana had a hard time with the, some of the collaborative pieces and they certainly spent a lot more money on it than people are thinking about spending right now on this product in the US. And so much of that is on things like normalizing data sets so they can speak to one another. And it's not clear that that is in fact what everyone needs uh, out of the gate. Echo likes to say that everyone should be prepared to personally rewrite the encyclopedia. And today I think we now have, we have a different kind of sense of scope. There's a sense that we can get hundreds of thousands of people to work together. Maybe we can also rebuild the public library and the notion of what that means. Quick housekeeping, if I speak too fast, just raise your hand. Thank you. And you can do that for individual sentences also. So I mentioned a few of these things. The one sentence description of the DPLA is a large scale digital public library to make the cultural and scientific record in the US available to all. With the idea that if this is a useful model, maybe it will also become more than just the US, or it will be replicated by other by other groups outside the US and Europe. With a platform for shared services, some easy ways to make something that you do that might be useful to others part of that shared platform, a network of, of institutions and people building these shared collections, a site and tools to improve visibility of current work, and an open community of practice, of critics, of testers, figuring out what does and doesn't work in our digital glam space. There are a few principles that guide the work. All the metadata will be public domain, will work with content providers regardless of their current access policies, but no new access restrictions will be made. And again, there's a, there's a, a, moral, a moral pressure to encourage people to be more open. And I think in general, most institutions that are not completely open would love to be. They just don't necessarily know how to do that in a sustainable way. And the processes are all open and transparent. There is a steering committee. There's a, there's now, we're not, there's a nonprofit being formed to, in the next three, or three to five years, support this idea. The steering committee meetings are all public. Anyone can attend. All the workshops are public. The six work groups, the work streams that, that gather to talk about different aspects of the project are also public. So uh, if you're interested in any of these things, you can get involved right away. There are a few, there's a set of use cases being worked on this month to define what people should build first in the next nine months. There's a workshop on that in, here in Baltimore at the Anna Free Public Library, July 27th. Oh, that's someone from the library? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so people are welcome. If you, want, if you want to join that, talk to me afterwards. And the question is, how are we all going to use digital, digital glam projects? How are we going to use digital resources next? There's a, there's a project to gather data hubs in an effort to define how the dozens of groups of, I guess hundreds of groups of different sizes who want to work together can do so. Uh, we, the content and scope group carved out the notion of being a data hub if you have a certain, uh, a certain quality of metadata, a certain size. These are a bunch of the institutions that have already fed into the alpha project being tested. Uh, hopefully, whatever institutions you work for would be able to be a data hub, or to just clone this idea and use it yourself if you're working within a private environment. And here again, help is needed to, to write scripts for different kinds of ingestion to, uh, to do recruitment to get, people, to get people engaged. And the question is, what's re what is really useful to share? Technical aspects, uh, I mentioned the Mozilla Ignite Challenge. There are a number of beta sprints that different institutions have, have submitted and are will be part of the beta launch, which will be in April next year. And we'll be discussing a lot of those issues at the end conference. And then there are a bunch of current challenges. Yes? Can you, can you just go back for a moment? Yes. Did you have a question? Uh, I just like to get something. Sure. So I mean, the Mozilla Ignite Challenge is a $500,000 pool of funds that will be distributed over the course of three stages of different kinds of work. One of the chunks of work is going to be um, how to improve programmatic access to digital digital cultural work. 
So current challenges. Digitizing physical works or doing it in a scalable way can be hard. Classifying new works that aren't traditional can be hard. Uh, sharing interface development so that you don't have thousands of people all designing the same kind of interface to search for a particular type of, of knowledge should be easy, but it isn't currently. And there are a lot of current projects to support. Here's an example. Um, you can see all of these projects, zero ISBN numbers, very hard to catalog. And there is something of a deadline. Here's the Cologne City Archive, which was destroyed by a storm a few months before it was going to be digitized and moved. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things we say on Wikipedia. There is a deadline. There's some work that we should all try to do now. A few wiki examples quickly. Special collections, wiki loves monuments, making these visible to other people as a special collection. 150,000 images, 160,000 last year, maybe 500,000 this year. That's not visible to libraries that want to share metadata in the form that they're used to. Wikidata itself for structured data, fantastic work. Of the wiki site project, uh, an effort to have an entry for every citation anywhere where people around which people can discuss how the citation is used and what it's good for. OpenStreetMap replacing the traditional notion of a maps collection in some sense. Everyone does have something to share, uh, and it's important to get that message out. And then tomorrow's libraries will be hacked by people who have grown up with access to knowledge in a, with a different kind of intensity and immediacy. Uh, here's, here's a fifth grader reading offline in Peru about seven days from the internet, but has a beautiful collection of works that was put together in part by a university library group. They didn't do that as a service. It took a few hundred hours of volunteer time. But what they did could have been provided as a service that said, make me a snapshot. That's all. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, in 2009, I, um, I noticed that there was a request for a certain uh, image of a, a very influential pianist was being requested. So he's actually, in real life, he's actually my piano teacher's piano teacher. So I um, was lucky to have the connections to figure out one thing that his you know, one of his few photographs that existed, he did not like to be photographed. And he's, okay, this is, this is Egon Petrie, and here's some details about it, but if you, if you actually click on the, pho on the photograph, I actually had to um, na navigate Wikipedia's, uh, you know, uh, th there's a, gu you know, a guiding thing for people who want to contribute photographs, and it, unfortunately, almost none of it applied to me, because I, um, I don't think the editors who were reviewing the case in question realized that I was actually going for a public domain. Because uh, actually, let me read this for you. Um, it's uh, it seems odd, but this this was actually very it's actually very generously written copyright law. <clears throat> this image is in the public domain because according to our Article Three of the Copyright Law of March 29, 1926, of the Public Republic of Poland, and Article Two of Copyright Law of July 10, 1952, of the People's Republic of Poland, all photographs by pol Polish photographers not published for the first time, or sorry, or published for the first time in Poland, or simultaneously in Poland and abroad. Legal <laughs> well, without a clear copyright notice before the law was changed in May 23rd, 1994, are assumed to be public domain. Okay, all that to get to the same like this is what public domain is. It does not have, it does, does it just needs to lack a, a, an attribution to a particular photographer, and it has to be you know provably within this this big range. So this, this is like, is, uh, there is no source of proof that it was published in that time. So well, actually, an associate of my piano teacher. Um, <laughs> I asked him about this. I asked him about this photograph, because it's actually the best one. And he says, well, I have been writing for Rish Mishizni for the ensuing, actually, he wrote, he wrote this article on Patreon, and he also wrote the original article on Patreon, which is the source for this photograph. In other words, the, the, the magazine is its own source. It, apparently, it survived, the, it, survived the, um, it survived the war. And they're old, they're old issues, and he just scans. So if he's looking for an image of Petri, he goes and finds an old, an old edition, and he scans it. And uh, the editors, when they asked, when I told them about this, I said, well, I had, because I had to triangulate the dates. I had to, I had to prove, like, what Petri was in Poland between here and here. I can't really prove, I can't really prove to you anything. I don't know who took the photograph. But they said to me, what is this quote, Archie one? I was like, well, P, H is F, and R, W is V, so figure it out. It's photo archive. They have a rich <laughs> photo archive that is waiting to be scanned. And since this magazine is, it was in continual publication you know, for the 20th century and before, I would suggest that this might be a rich source for photos and for other, you know, other, other related information. 
although you know the, uh, the con article content itself might uh, be encumbered, but um, but the actual photograph is not. So um, this might be this might possibly be um, a good a good place to go. So go go to Krakow and visit you know the offices of Russian Shishny, who's you know and I know this guy is still still around. Um, the uh, author here is still giving classes, master classes, you know, in, the, in Chopin and uh, the technique of Chopin and the patron and various other people. So Kustrela is his name. So um, it might just be a matter of organizing a visit to this magazine and, uh, and going through, uh, you know, at least as long as they understand that you're going through and you're going to, you know, make public all of their non-attributed photographs. So this might be a very good way of, it doesn't actually come under the thing of land, you know, it's not, a, it's not a museum in and of itself, it's not a library. But this might be another, just another way to get, oh yeah, and I have to talk to the other guy about bulk image uploading because this might be a good opportunity to actually use that feature and say, it's, yeah, we've already cleared this, it's within these dates, quality of the Polish copyright law, so that, 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 that's all, that's all I'm here. Because the, the, I find that this, the, um, the same, that the, actually when it comes to copyright law, it's good that we're talking about the public domain because when it comes to copyright law, we sort of lost that battle, lifetime plus 70, yeah, the mouse has won, so, um, so until, you know, there's possible ways for us to, uh, you know, what I, have, I am hopeful in, in some ways, because for one thing, if they can break it retroactively, we can fix it retroactively. I don't know if anybody disagrees with that, but, um, you know, so perhaps it's a matter of, you know, I'm a big fan of Lawrence Lessig and the Creative Commons and archive.org. So matter, maybe it's a matter of um, starting a copyfightarchive.org where we can upload these things until, you know, until you know, more sensible minds have managed to pass some laws or, or undo the, the damage that the Disney Corporation has done, essentially. Um, because you know, the, the fact that lifetimes, I take a photo of my tennis shoes and that has the same protection that anything, that any other, you know, copy that any other image or book or film has to me is just so absurd and obviously these laws were not written for the tsunami of, so we have a tsunami of digital media today with all of which is uncumbered and we also have um, images such as this which are of interest and which could very well be lost because the magazine itself is going to deteriorate nobody thought to scan it or there when you don't do scan it there's no actual place to say, hey, this is of interest, it's uncumbered, maybe we can just scan it and somebody else can figure it out, or not. You know, but I just, I think that it would be nice to have such a thing. You know, because um, if I hadn't been lucky enough to be able to answer all those questions and be able to, because they, well, they went away after I asked the question, they went away for about an hour, and I guess they were on some IRC channel, I don't really know how these things work on, on Wikipedia, but it came back and said, oh yeah, use post domain, you know, pull it. And he gave me the thing, and it comes up with the with the eagles and everything. But um, but I just happened to have like to know to know to have read enough about the Polish copyright law to know that this guy was important enough to, to actually be able to navigate all the way through that and realize that what I really want to go through, go for is the public domain. And it's a shame that there isn't more, or that it's hard to meet that bar. And it's a shame that there isn't perhaps a fast track or you know. I don't know, it's just a shame that, that this is a one-off thing, and I would like to see more of it, more of the 20th century being saved than perhaps will be, unless we make an effort to do so. Um, I guess that's it, unless anybody has questions. Did you want to? Why don't we get Richard a, a, a round of applause, and then we'll... Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll briefly take questions for both Richard and Sam. Sam was the one that talked about the digital library, and Richard's obviously talking about this one photo as a, a case study. Uh, yes. I just, I've thought about this several times during several of these talks, and I wanted to throw out there to your point, when you say, oh, uh, we sort of lost the, the, the copyright or we lost the, the public domain. That's not entirely true. The rights of copying are only those of the copyright holders, so far as they choose to exercise them. And I think it's incumbent on all of us who care about this sort of thing. Uh, for example, I'm a member of the Linguistic Society of America, which publishes a journal which is copyrighted. However, they're really thinking seriously about saying, no, we want this out there. We want to publish this on the internet. We want to make it freely available. And it's up to all of us to take part in, in convincing people that, yeah, maybe Lifetime Plus 70 isn't 
always the right answer. Right. And the more pressure and the more, the more visibility we get, I think like, institutions will say, well, yeah, our stuff is hungry, but we're going to go and go for season. By the way, uh, CCPD, which didn't exist as a designation when I did this, I don't think even CC0 is So, yeah, I mean, these are both around the, around the podium. And I, I think it's actually a tragedy that there is no worldwide public domain. You know, it's like Poland has a public domain, but the U.S. can still you can still publish a photograph and then you can say, sorry, you have, to, you have to pull that because I published that in my own magazine in the U.S. Yeah. So that is a tragedy. So, so there, there are mechanisms for trying to make that a reality, like, you know, global public domain. The uh, WIPO this coming week is actually negotiating uh, exceptions for copyright, for libraries, and, and for the it. blind. I mean, you, you don't fix it if ever, you know, all these libraries right. are being forced and people are being forced to agree to them when they make Right. So, so it, again, it's incumbent on us to put pressure on those institutions that, that you know, are governing this, this sphere of... When I say we failed, I just mean that, let's say, we did argue a case in front of the Supreme Court, and he was trying to roll back I have a question for Richard about uh, uh, the copyright in uh, socialist and communist countries that did not have copyright certain periods. So when, when they become part of the Berne Convention, like a lot of them, it's 1994. Right. So do well, they retroactively the get copyright? Whether the archive existed or whether it was bombed out, like whether the magazine's offices have actually been damaged. I think actually, can I, answer, I can answer that one. What happened with the PB College license is that the, the original license was the, uh, the original license uh, said that uh, such images were never copyrighted. So when the law changed in the 1996, uh, when they were kind of early convention and so on, uh, only things that were copyrighted before get retroactively added. The stuff that was never copyrighted was not. So that's the only reason why that template is still around. One last question, and we're going to let you go to a break. Thanks. Uh, this question is for, for Sam. I was really interested in your list of the guidelines uh, for the institutions that you're saying that they can keep the restrictions they currently have, they just can't add new restrictions. But the restrictions they currently have include things about being a member of the library or being on the faculty or staff of the university or, or a student at the university, which in effect is cutting it off. And this goes back to the very interesting first presentation that we had today, which is saying that in fact things that are supposed to be in the public domain aren't because you don't have to have you don't have a right to borrow that particular material because of the rules of the institution. Yes, absolutely. And I, I should have clarified those kinds of restrictions are not currently supported in the model. So th there, are, there are institutions that don't, they have collections which are not available under free copyright. But in order for them to share it all with this, with this national platform, they have to be willing to say, well, we're sharing this with other libraries, and we're not going to, we're not going to impose library membership restrictions. But it's just to say that it would be nice to live in a world where we could say, well, all materials in in a, digital, in a digital archive or digital library will be available under a free license. Um, as a society, we're not quite there yet. So yes, I, that's, that is a really big issue of dealing with, with, with content hubs. I think all of our, all of our content hubs um, at present are going, to, are going to have access available to anyone visiting the library online. Okay, the next session starts at 3.40, and let's give our presenters one last round of applause. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>